o'clock or so, um, and go till I don't know. Till, I, I, I reserve the place until four. Um, we need some breakdown time or whatever. I don't think they're going to really kick us out. So, you know, we'll just see. You know, if it was me talking, we'd be here till midnight. But I think Aaron's about the same. So uh, that's what we'll do. And I'm going to just. Uh, Erin Forbes is, uh, she's from Maine, she has a business called Overland Honey of Maine, she's a, 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 a what, yes, thing? director, chairman of the East Neighbor Culture Society board, uh, and I'm going to let her tell you uh, the rest about herself from there. Um, so here's Erin Forbes. Thank you. I'm going to confess right now that I have really planned out like the first 45 minutes of this program, and then the rest of it, I'm going to kind of wing it. I have in my bag of thumb drives every single fee presentation I've ever given in my life, and so I can talk about anything you want to talk about. So um, I'm going to kind of start with what I want to tell you guys, and then I'm going to move on to what you want to hear. But I always like to know who I'm talking to and kind of what the, what the room is so that I know which level to go at. So who in here doesn't actually have bees at all yet? Nobody. Excellent. Okay. Who has had bees for five years or more? Okay, lots. And then, so maybe more than half. And who has more than ten colonies? Okay, so a few. And who has done their own queen rearing? Okay, great. Awesome. And um, whose bees are all dead now? Okay, yeah, I know. And who has more colonies than they can handle and needs to figure out how to scale that? Okay, 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 good. I think, I think you guys are my target demographic, so that's super. Um, so I always like to show, I put a couple pictures of my operation in the beginning here. Whenever I listen to anybody talk about anything in beekeeping, I always want to know the context of their... Um, apiary and kind of what their management style is before I'm going to actually listen to their content because, you know, I try to judge whether or not I'm going to buy into whatever the program is. So I like to kind of show my stuff too. Um, so here's a picture of me. I love showing pictures of me with bees on my face. Um, I think that it's important for people in general to realize that human beings and bees can interact in lots of really positive ways. It doesn't necessarily you know, involve one person getting stung and another person dying. So um, anyway, I just like to include that photo. But I run about 150 colonies with my business partner, Cindy B, whose actual name is Cindy B. She's a third generation beekeeper from Georgia. And I'll say a little bit about that. I'm an EAS certified master beekeeper, which basically means that I took the test through EAS that Roger Morse developed and began this program of certifying master beekeepers in the 70s in response to the need for uh, basically good quality extension around beekeeping because um, there's a lack of funding basically in the agricultural sector and so it's important to have people who can teach beekeeping. Um, I've been raising northern nucleus colonies um, and my own queens for sale for about 10 years now and I used to be the um, president of the Maine State Beekeepers Association now and the chairman of the Eastern Apicultural Society, which basically means that I volunteer for things that I don't have time for. <laughs> um, in my straight job, and I do have a straight job, I'm the chief financial officer at the Coastal Maine Botanical Gardens. Have any of you guys ever been up there? And so that's my, that's my, real, that's my real life, is I'm an accountant. Um, and I, of course, brought my bees to work. I always bring my bees to work everywhere that I've worked, um, but at the Botanic Garden they fit in particularly well. And so if you ever have the opportunity to make it up to Booth Bay, Maine, and want to come visit, if it's during, if it's on a weekday, tell the front desk that, hey, I'm a beekeeper and I want to talk to the accountant. Um, and I always <laughs> welcome an excuse to get out of my office and go fool around with my bees. Um, this is a picture of my bee yard at home, actually quite a few years ago. Um, so I live on an extraordinary piece of property in Portland. I'm actually on seven and a half acres. And so, you know, for being in the city, you know, I talk about being in the city, but the context is a little more than the average small lot in Portland. I live up against the marsh over down by the airport. And so there just happens to be a piece of property that big and I happen to be lucky enough to live on it. 
This is my new bee shed. I just took this picture and put it on Facebook the other day. Um, I had to build a 12 by 20 timber frame barn to contain all my beekeeping equipment. And I like to uh, say this and share that because a lot of the um, solutions to beekeeping problems involve having all of the right equipment at the right time and so when you're just working with foundation and you're expanding your apiary often your hands are kind of tied behind your back but when you have this kind of equipment and drawn comb that makes your life a lot easier um, it also increases your probability of divorce by a lot and so i'm just only acknowledging that um, so this is my bee yard at my old work allagash brewing company i still do have bees there when i gave my notice there and uh, told Allagash that I had accepted a job as a CFO of the Botanic Gardens. They were like, oh wow, that's a super drag, but you're not going to take the bees, are you? Um, and so we do still raise bees. In fact, I'm selling them 450 pounds of honey next week to do a brew with... Um, this is our nuke yard, one of my nuke yards up in Jefferson. So Cindy and I bought a farm outside of Portland, about an hour and ten minutes away in Jefferson. Um, and we raised our nukes and had part of our stair project there. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. If you want to be in touch with me or keep track of what I'm doing, the best way to do it is to look at our Facebook, which I'm really bad at updating, but I'm even worse at updating our website because I just really don't have time to do my own life, let alone to you know, blog about it or whatever. But I do, when I'm do giving talks or whatever, I share it on Facebook and sometimes <laughs> I put, put fun pictures of what I'm doing. Overland honey, sorry, yes, Facebook is Overland honey. So again, here's my yarn, this is quite a few years ago, um, right basically after I certified as a master beekeeper. And so when I did that, I really um, was kind of thinking about what I wanted to do with my life now that I was a master beekeeper, now that I didn't have to study for the exams anymore. And so um, I decided that, you know, everybody's got to kind of bring their own gifts to, um, to their to the beekeeping world, and I decided that my gift was um, that I think I can write pretty well, and being an accountant, I can develop budgets, and so I decided I wanted to try to get a SARE grant to do some practical beekeeping work, but mostly just to take a little tiny bit of money out of the farm bill, which I'm quite positive goes to a bunch of things that I don't agree with, but I wanted to snatch a little piece of that money and send it to beekeeping and be useful. And so I had to then think of a project to do in order to write the grant, and so, and obviously I'm a northern beekeeper. The very first time I was ever in a room with other beekeepers literally was the Maine State Beekeepers Association meeting. I think it was 2006, maybe it was 2007, <coughs> excuse me. And Michael Palmer from Vermont was the speaker and he was talking about queenering and overwintering nukes. And this was literally like the, my very first April when we had started the year before and our bees weren't dead. I, then I had not met any other beekeepers at all. I had done everything only the wrong way that nobody should ever do. I had no bee school. I was learning from books only. And the internet back then didn't have a whole lot of beekeeping information. And so I really was just kind of alone. And then I go up there and Michael Palmer tells me that I can rear queens and overwintered nukes. And I was like, okay, I believe that. And so I left um, totally engrossed and full of the Kool-Aid and I never turned back and so I think this might be my third year of beekeeping overwintering, might be the second, no, it's the third, um, overwintering nukes over my parent colonies. Um, and so this is kind of the, back, the background of where I come from in beekeeping. And so um, I moved up a little bit. I graduated I had a little problem with impulse control when you start rearing queens and then you stop want, and then you not wanting to be selling them that leads to a lot of increase uh, and also when we very first started keeping bees in Portland uh, we have a little tiny neighborhood kind of local food slow food grocery store right down the street and as soon as they heard we had bees they were like we want to sell your honey which was you know I was like great but we're not going to have any honey for a long time because we only have two colonies and so from, from the very beginning, I also always had a market for that growth, and that was really helpful, and so it kind of led to me expanding. So Cindy B, really quickly, my business partner. So at one point, we got, I had so many colonies, and I was working at Allagash four days a week. I was running about 70 colonies by myself, and then I needed to go back to five days a week, and it was just way too much, and it got to the point that, like, on Monday, 
if the weather forecast was for crappy on the weekend, I would be just like filled with anxiety thinking about the fact that my bees were going to swarm while I was at work. And, you know, my husband was like, babe, you're going to have to solve this issue. And so I said that I was going to scale back to like 25 colonies, by which I meant 40. Um, but of course that would involve like felling bees, which would be like felling my left leg. And so instead I talked Cindy B into moving from Georgia up to Maine and going into business with me. Uh, at the time she was working for the US, um, sorry, for the <coughs> University of Georgia Bee Lab, running one of their grant programs and the grant study that they were doing was ending and she in her secret life, in her straight job is a beekeeper, has been a full-time beekeeper basically her whole life. She wrote the book on bee removal, um, like literally the book on bee removal is written by Cindy B and her um, friend Bill Owens. But anyway, so I was in her secret life, she's a writer. And so I was like, Maine, winter, writing, Stephen King, hello, you know, this would be awesome. And so she totally fell for that for like three years. Um, but I will confess that I don't quite know how I'm going to deal with this, but this past October, she accepted a job working for um, the Appalachia, this new Appalachian Bee Collective. It's called the Appalachian Bee Collective. They're basically teaching beekeeping to displace coal miners and all this kind of stuff in West Virginia, which is super cool. So she was here to put the bees away, and I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do next month when she is not here to um, bring the bees back, but she fled our Maine winters and has gone back down to the south and is now in West Virginia. But um, we still co-own the business together and talk about stuff, and now I just have an excuse to be going down to West Virginia all the time in the middle of the winter, which it is significantly warmer down there. So anyway, back to my SEER project, which is what I really wanted to talk about. So I'm going to give you guys the long version of this story because I feel like sometimes you just tell people facts and they do or do not absorb them, but really kind of how you got there is usually a big part of why it's important. And so SEER stands for Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. It's this little tiny arm of the USDA and they give grants for sustainable agriculture projects, particularly hands-on, on-the-ground projects, like trying to get farmers to implement real stuff. And they have different types of grants. They have larger grants and smaller grants. Their smallest ones are called farmer grants. And it's a farmer grant is literally, uh, I think the $15,000 is the cap now. It might have gone up a little bit. Um, and it's for people to do demonstration projects on their own um, whatever farm and to show different practices. And it's fun, and, and it, uh, it's a pretty easy process to apply. And so I wrote a grant uh, talking about survival of packages. And so Tony Jadzak, I don't know if you all know our former state apiarist who was just an amazing pillar in beekeeping, he often would just explain that, you know, packages coming from the south don't do as well as uh, overwintered nucleus colonies. Um, this is also a lot of what Michael Palmer would talk about. But the problem is that there, there really is no supply in overwintered nucleus colonies compared to the demand. And so Tony used to suggest requeening those packages. And he'd be like, you know, just requeen the package, whatever, and, which sounds very reasonable. But nobody actually had any empirical data on that. And so I decided that that was going to be my project. Um, I. What I did is I designed the project so that I had three groups of um, honeybee colonies that I was starting in the spring and quote unquote raising them just like a brand new beekeeper. So not moving anything around in between the colonies but actually just starting them out on foundation and running them all season as if each one were you know, a colony that a new beekeeper had gotten. And half of the, or sorry, Two thirds of the colonies were packages came in from Rossman apiaries in the south, and then one third of the new colonies were overwintered nucleus colonies that I had bought from local New England um, suppliers. And then the third thing, so I had two thirds packages and one third overwintered nucleus colonies, and then when overwintered queens became, or I mean, when northern rakes queens were available in June, I took half of the packages and requeened them with the northern raised queens. 
to then compare the three groups, just the straight packages, the northern rays, clean packages, and the overwintered nucleus colonies. Because basically, it's no good to tell people that you should use overwintered nukes if you can't buy them. And so then the question was, if we re-clean some of these packages, would that make any difference? Like, would they get any closer to their quote-unquote alleged increased survival rate of these overwintered nucleus colonies? Because of course, most people who do packages don't have access to a comparative group. And if you have access to overwintered nukes, you're not gonna compare them to packages. And of course, it could be beekeeper skill or whatever that's causing all the problems. Like lots of people say kind of in the industry, if you go to larger beekeeping meetings, people will say that the quality of packages have gone down, but the commercial beekeepers will say, no, they haven't. What it is is the quality of new beekeepers has gone down and they're worse. And so who, who knows, right? So we're all blaming and pointing the finger. So I thought, I, I want to illustrate this. I want to shed a little light. So um, this is basically what I just explained to you guys. But so overwinter nucleus colonies appear to have better survival, but we don't know. Um, the other thing that is important is that I, even at the most fundamental level, queens that don't move around as much are just going to be by definition better because they spend less time in cages. And, by, and I just did this when I said they spend less time in cages. And why, by this, I meant ovarian development, right? That's what I was pointing to, is less atrophy in my ovaries. Sorry. But um, so anyway, so those are important things. This is just part of the story. Um, the thing, you know, and also, you know, I'm an accountant, as I said, and I'm going to tell you guys all the story of my life over the course of today. But one of the things that's true about accountants is they basically run a little P&L on anything that anybody describes ever. Like, so if you told me, like, oh, I'm a cleaning lady, I'd be like, I'm going to $60 an hour, minus whatever the costs are, driving around Massachusetts. You know what I mean? Like, I literally run a little P&L on stuff. And I think it is important that we figure out a way for young people, and by young people I mean people half my age or less, to see a path into beekeeping so we don't all join be become beekeepers when we're in our 30s and 40s and 50s, that actually 20 year olds can look at beekeeping and figure out a way to make a living and think this is what I want to do, and preferably part of that being queen rearing and nuke production as opposed to pollination contracts, because pollination is basically, you know, depending on who you talk to, and depending on my mood and how much wine I've been drinking, it's basically like human trafficking as far as I'm concerned in terms of like the kindness to the colony, which is not to say that those colonies aren't busting their ass, but you know, so are people who are being human trafficked. So anyway, um, so back to making an industry of re rearing noble queens. So here are my overwintered northern race nucleus colonies, and I want to explain what that means. So an overwintered nucleus colony is not a split in the spring. And people, there are a couple of beekeepers who sell colonies in Maine in the spring that they literally advertise in our local bee journal as Maine bees, which they are, but they have queens that come from California, and that is a split. Like, overwintered nucleus colony is made up the prior year, wintered over as a single unit, and in the spring, everybody is the daughter of the queen who was there last fall, preferably the queen that you raised yourself, certainly one from the north. That's an overwintered nucleus colony. So really the question is, do those colonies do any better than a package, a straight up package? And if that's true, that's super, but you know, whatever, because you can't buy them. And so will the requeen packages show any difference? So um, we have to talk for very quickly. I'm sure you guys all know this, but I'm just going to go over it one more time. Why is requeening important? And so the trick is that queens mate when they are young, when they're you know basically somewhere between six and 15 days old, they do this little mating process, and all of the sperm that they're ever going to carry in their bodies is accumulated at that time. And so therefore, when you pick up a queen from one bee yard, you pick up a queen from my bee yard, and she's got in her body her own genetics, her own, you know, chromosomes and DNA, and then she's got the chromosomes and DNA in the sperm that she stored in her body in Maine. And so if you take a queen out of my yard in Maine, and you put it down here in your package that you got from wherever, and she, when she starts laying eggs, 
45 days later, everybody in that colony is going to be the daughters of my bee yard and is going to be the genetics of my bee yard. And so if that genetics of my bee yard is better suited to your area, you've just changed the whole colony by the process of requeening. And there are a significant number of traits that are traced to queens and also, um, also to the drones. But the genetic behavior determines a lot of factors in the overall honeybee colony behavior, not just on the individual level. So, there's a darling little queen, and she's so cute. She wants out. Okay, so this is just a cute queen picture. Um, and here's another cute queen picture. So, can you see that this looks like Italian honeybees? Do we all know Italians and how golden and beautiful they are? I think of Italian honeybees as like the golden retrievers of the <laughs> honeybee world. Like, they're nice, and they're like, irrationally exuberant all the time. They always love everybody. They're very reproductive. Um, and then this is a kind of nor a typical northern looking bee. Um, you might call her Carniole and you might call her Minnesota Hygienic. You might call her anything. Um, I don't actually claim a, a, a type of bee that I have because I brought in too many random genetics into my bee yard. But um, Michael Palmer would call his queens um, varroa sensitive hygienic, and that's pretty typically what uh, most of the northern stocks are coming from is that VSH line that came out of Minnesota combined with carnial ones and Russia. So, we're talking about changing those two colonies. So, Michael Palmer is one of the suppliers of the queens in my project, in my, in my Sarah project. This is his queen yard up in Vermont. We actually went to his yard and picked our queens out of his mating nukes and caged them ourselves, which was super fun. Um, Rosman Apiaries, which is a very large um, beekeeping operation out of Georgia that sends a lot of packages up here to New England. I'm sure that you guys have all seen Rosman packages. Um, they're down in Moultrie, Georgia. Fred Rossman is an amazing person and his operation is super cool. So we went down and picked our packages up from him. So all of our packages came from Rossman. Um, and so we talked about this a little bit, you guys know, but we're, so we're gonna try to change our genetics. So, gonna, we already talked about that. Okay, back again to our queens. So the commercial Italians came from Rossman, as I said, the northern raised nucleus colonies came from Gilman Muja. I don't know if you guys know him. He raises nukes in Connecticut. He's um, Albanian. Um, very interesting guy, my age. Um, I, I don't know what he does for a straight job, but beekeeping is his big sideline. Mike Palmer gave us, sold us queens. Bob Brackman sold us queens. In the second year of my project, I literally could not locate overwintered nucleus colonies to buy. Like, I needed them for the project, I had the funding, I have pretty good connections, and I literally couldn't find anybody to sell me nukes at all. So I had to use my own, because there was no one else to get them from. Um, and so here again, I'm showing us our Italians and our, our, our northern queens. Um, I spent a lot of time in the beginning of the project and in the design of the project thinking about um, trying to make sure that everything was independent and fair and clear so that people wouldn't think that I had artificially like fallen in love with my own colonies and like skewed the data by my colony by my you know kind of project design and so in the first two years I had two different beekeepers myself and somebody else and we had two separate bee yards we had independent people coming and inspecting the colonies monthly so that we also had their data points as well as ours in terms of colony strength. And so, you know, I was very focused on that. The other thing that I really, really worried about when I did this project was that, you know, because I can keep bees in the shoebox almost literally. I mean, I've overwintered medium five frame nukes. I was like, you know, what if they all do fantastically and everybody just performs amazing? And like, then we have no data. You know, these are the kinds of things I worry about, which obviously was not a problem in the end, as you'll see. But so the first year we had 24 colonies split into two apiaries. So we had eight overwintered nukes, 16 packages, and then requeened half of the packages in June. Um, this is the Standish yard that was run by my collaborating beekeeper, Larry Pfeiffer. Um, here's his yard. So 
The, the protocol involves painting all the hives the same color, but with different markings so that we would have to reduce drift. Um, this is my yard that same year. You can see from the paint color that I'm the same. This is the day that I was installing the nukes. Obviously, the packages came before the nukes, which is typical in the north. Our packages came April 15th was kind of the very um, consistent delivery date of our local package supplier, um, the, the guy who brought Rossman, brings Rossman up to Maine. Um, and then these were the nukes that we got from Gilman when we installed them. The second year, we had a little bit, the first year the funding cap was $10,000, the second year the funding cap moved to $15,000, so then I was able to get 30 colonies into the project. So that year we had 10 overwintered nukes and 20 packages. Um, and so this is the second year, this is in Buxton, Maine, this is actually on Poland Spring Water property. And then, um, and there's Larry Pfeiffer the previous year. And there's my um, there's the sec my second year project. This is in Westbrook, Maine, in the beautiful Westbrook Industrial Park, which was at the warehouse of the place that I worked at the time, Planet Dog. Or no, I'm sorry, I didn't work there at the time. This was at Planet Dog, where I, but it was after I had left them, but they let me use their yard. Okay. And so then in year three, I redesigned the project. So the third year, in order to get more data, um, because I, my first two years data was, my first year's data was really interesting and promising and so that I had to reapply and got the second year grant saying I, need, I wanted to do it again. And then I started talking about it and getting out in beekeepers and although people were listening to me, I felt like I wanted a higher level of statistical significance in my results. And so the third year, I wanted more colonies. And so I took 50 colonies to the third year. And this time, I just said, skip the nukes. We know that the nukes are outperforming the packages, which is what everybody said they would do, and they are doing that. I'm just going to get all packages, and I'm just going to requeen half of them, and we're going to see how that goes and see what that does to our yard. And so we brought all 50 colonies in the same yard. We took them all up to our farm in Jefferson, and Cindy and I ran them together. Because one of the things that I have found about collaborating with other people is they don't necessarily do 100% of exactly what I tell them to do all the time, <laughs> even when I'm perfectly clear. I don't I understand that, right? Um, and so I had felt like there had been some issues between the separating the two yards that led to different things. Uh, and mostly, like as we all do, when something goes wrong with colonies, what do we do, right? We blame the beekeeper. So anyway, so I was like, Larry kicked off his team and I'm going to be the boss of this. So this is our third year. Our third year we painted purple. Um, we set the colonies up in horseshoes in order to get all 50 into the yard without a whole lot of drift. Um, you can kind of see the horseshoe shape of these different pods. These, this is another pod. And so we ran the 50 colonies through um, the project the next year. And I did actually switch my equipment as well. I don't know if you're noticing here that these are all eight frame medium colonies, medium equipment. And in the past, I had been using standard 10 frame equipment because that's what worked with the nukes. But since we weren't using nukes, I could move to eight frame totally, I mean to medium totally. And eight frame, um, I have found, at least in my yard, is a little bit better configuration because often in, uh, where I am at least, the bees will, the cluster will move right up the center of a 10 frame box, leaving two giant walls of honey on the side, but that they can't access because their cluster isn't loose enough. So I moved us into eight frame, which brings the honey in closer and more towards the top. Of course, that also means that you have more boxes and more frames to inspect, so it's a little bit more work, not to mention the assembly process, but um, they, it works well for me, and so I'm not getting any younger, and I don't love picking up 10 frame boxes of honey. So, total of the three-year projects, we had 180, I mean, sorry, 104 colonies total. By the end of the project, we only had 86 left. So. The Buxton yard at the, the one on Poland Spring property, we disqualified the entire yard because they had a pesticide um, incident. Um, we suspect with cucurbits nearby pumpkin field that the bees got into, but so we had that problem. And then we had three colonies that swarmed and didn't successfully requeen themselves. So we kicked them out of the project so, and requeened them separately. But so their results weren't there. So we have 86 total colonies that remained in the project space. Um, and how we did this 
basic protocol, everybody was going to be in identical brand new equipment, so nobody has the advantage of better propolis envelope or any of those things. <coughs> we use brand new wired wax foundation in all colonies, which is what I use. I'm an old school. Not only do I use wires, but I cross embed like, you know, like they teach you in the B books from 1955, because um, pins just don't last as well. We fed, expanded, and supered as necessary by the colony. This was not, we don't do everybody on the same day, it's we do everybody when they need it. Um, so we we're running like a new beekeeper would. We monitored for mites and diseases, but we didn't do any special treatment. Nobody actually got out of our protocol on that. And then we measured honey production and colony strength. So here's me, um, Tom Sawyer, in our local bee club into painting equipment for me, which was great. It is quite amazing. I had a, um, I had an interesting conversation one time with Dave Mendez. I don't know if you guys know who he is. He used to be a very big commercial beekeeper, ran about 7,000 colonies. And we were just talking about random stuff. And I was talking, we were talking about, you know, when he switched to feeding, he was feeding pollen. Uh, kind of when CCD just started kicking up, they really started focusing on nutrition. And he said to me that he had to build a building to house his feeder buckets because that's how many colonies he had. And that is actually a really interesting thing is when you start realizing that a lot of beekeeping is about logistics and assembling 50 colonies worth of equipment is a logistical, really a project. So anyway, so we enlisted to some help for that and that was great. Um, this is the, the purple bee equipment inside the farm in Jefferson. Cindy built almost everything by herself. I confess that I did very little helping. There's my F-250 full of foundation. So anyway, just showing some fun pictures and of course we wired and waxed, like I said. And here we are painting our purple hives in the front yard at the farm, um, getting ready for uh, installation of the packages. One thing that is very interesting up here in the north is basically it's like winter, 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 and it's spring. And so you don't have a lot of time for like, painting outside, you know, there's not a lot of 50 degree days before the bees arrive. And so it's just, it is an interesting thing um, for us logistically up here. And so here's Cindy and Fred Rossman. This is not a great picture, too bad that you can't see us, but this is at Fred's place. And that's our trailer. It says, bees are hungry, plant more flowers, please. We, that's what we drove from Moultrie, Georgia back to Maine, which was fun. Um, we had quite a little adventure with that. Um, and here we are getting ready to assemble the bees. A couple of friends of mine helping in the bee yard. There's Cindy and there's our friend Bonnie Pendleton who helped us paint and install. And then we install the packages all on the same day, obviously. It's really, this is another fun thing. Like, I don't know if you've ever had this experience or if you have the opportunity to do it. But if you ever get into a place where, you're in, where you have the chance to help out either installing bees or running 40 or 50 colonies in one yard, it's a really... Um, it's dynamic and it's fun and it's exciting and they, I mean the excitement of 50 packages when they get out of the package they're happy and they are you know there's a lot going on they're flying around they're discovering food I mean it was just a really magical place to be not that an apiary isn't always a magical place but this is cool <coughs> so here I am so we fed the colonies obviously until they had drawn out their foundation that's an awesome picture that somebody took of my packages. We had some visiting photographers come um, and got some really good quality pictures. So there was a, that's the package, there's the nukes. Here I am installing the nucleus colony. There's actually a video on YouTube of me installing a package. So if anybody ever wants, if you have a new bacon or beekeeper that you're mentoring and you want to talk to them about installing a picture, you can tell them to Google Aaron Forb install a package. And it's actually shot in my stair yard. I had somebody come do it, it's cute. And then there's also a video of me installing nukes just like this. And so we just basically installed the bees and inspected them. And <coughs> wrote, took detailed notes. I modified the old fashioned day dance hive inspection sheet to fit my project just a little bit more about kind of disease monitoring and what kind of treatments we have. But it, basically it's the old day dance inspection sheet. And so we inspected the colonies and just kept track of everything. This is one of the visiting beekeepers who came just to do an inspection. That's um, Davida Skye. She's a local beekeeper in Maine who's had bees for many years. And so we just let the colonies run as they were. And, you know, some are bigger and some are littler. And, you know, as I was saying, I was worried that their data was going to be 
too much, too identical, and which is crazy. I mean, like, sometimes in retrospect, I think to myself, like, how did I ever even think that thing? That's like saying you adopt 11 golden retriever puppies all from the same litter, and you raise them in the same house, and they're going to have the same personality. Like, they just don't. I mean, they're, I mean, they're all going to be golden retrievers, but one is going to be shy, and one of them is going to be barking, and one of them is going to be biting, and that's exactly what these colonies were like. They're immediately from the very first day, you know, one is acting like this and the other is acting like that. So my fear about the colonies being all the same was completely ridiculous. Um, here again is the Sear Yard in Westbrook, the second year project, and this is as the colonies are growing. You can see that some of them are much bigger than the other ones. This one I'm still feeding. I don't know if you can see that that's still an inner cover. This one is on their third honey super, and I'm feeding this one. Um, it's very, it was really interesting. And so then we wintered over. And then we basically um, measured them in the spring. Tony Jazek was our technical advisor. He's the former state apiarist. He was really, he's, he is an amazing person. It's not like he's dead. He's just not our state apiarist anymore. It means he's dead to me, but not really. <laughs> he's actually a really cruel guy, but, um, and knows more about bees than anybody that I can, that I personally know very well. So, um, as part of the project, what I did is one of my deliverables was to write an article every two months for our state newsletter because I really wanted the people to the people of the state of Maine and the people of the United States who had funded this project to have some sense of ownership and know what was going on. And so I would write articles about installing the equipment, you know, building the equipment and do this thing. So those are all also if you decide that you want to look into this project any further, all of those things are on the SARE website, because it's part of the deliverables of my project. Um, and here again is the 50 colonies. Those were my little horseshoes up there. This is the backyard at the farm in Jefferson, um, the bees going through winter. Um, Michael Palmer likes to say that winter is the great selector, which is true. And I'll tell you this, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm a very honest person, particularly when it comes to beekeeping. Um, and I don't like to sugarcoat stuff. The fact of the matter is, New England is arguably the best place in the United States to keep bees because of our A, relative lack of pesticides, particularly in Maine, B, our nearly continual nectar flow with virtually no slowdown and truly no dearth in a normal year, and C, winter is so long and so hard that you cannot manipulate colonies through winter. In the south, they can limp along junk, as I like to call it. Like they can limp along weak colonies, they can limp along disease colonies, they can feed all the time, they can feed intermittently to keep these, but up here, if your colonies aren't cooking with gas, as I like to say, in the fall, they're not gonna be around in the spring. And if we were to somehow get it together to shut our borders to southern imported bees, and just actually let the survivors be the ones who survive and then mate with each other, we could really have a much healthier um, beekeeping ecosystem up here. But that's a whole other um, deal. But anyway, so we really don't have junk coming out of winter up here. So, and so, queen, you know, survival is, is, is basically my selection criteria. So, we did do monitoring of mites, both through um, powdered sugar roll, and then you know shake the powdered sugar out and count the mites, and then let the bees back. We also did alcohol wash. Um, we also Tony did some nosema spore counts for me, and then we also used screen bottom boards to um, monitor under bottom. And literally, averaged over time, the mite counts were equally distributed across the board for all three groups of bees. There was no difference at all in the, um, in the mite counts between the three treatments. I mean, and by three treatments, I mean nucleus, Greek queen package, and package. We used apolife bar in all of the colonies, which is my standard management practice in, in, um, in my apiary. Uh, apolife bar is the, not to be confused with apivar, Apolifar is the thymol menthol eucalyptus um, product that comes out of France. Okay, honey production was 
very much a secondary concern because we all know that we teach beginner beekeepers not to expect honey in the beginning, but we did measure honey when the, in the ones that they made. So only my two yards, neither of Larry's yards made any honey to harvest at all, and only my two yards in 2009, 2010 actually produced honey, um, which I attribute to their urban suburban locations because Larry's were a little bit more rural. And so I had a lot more tree bloom. Uh, I had, you know, a, a lot more linden. I had a lot more ornamental tree bloom. And then the year in 2013, we had 50 colonies in one rural location. And so although we had adequate forage, they didn't make enough, they didn't have enough forage to uh, make extra honey. And again, we didn't have the big tree bloom that we have in the city. Okay, so honey production. We only had uh, 11 colonies making honey, and they produced, the packages produced more honey than the other ones. Um, I attribute this in part to the fact that the nukes were a little swarmier than the packages, um, but, and also to the fact that Italian honeybees, this is really one of their specialties, is ridiculous over hoarding and ridiculous overpopulation. And so they are not super responsive to weather um, and to stresses. They basically will just make more bees and make more honey as much as possible, which if those are your goals, that's awesome. But if your goals are not death, then that isn't necessarily the best strategy. Um, so this is the overall results of all of the colonies. So this is the 104, not the, not the um, disqualified colonies. I'm going to show you the disqualified colonies in a minute. But so you can see that the colonies headed by packaged queens, where am I here? These are the ones that are alive. So we only had 23 colonies out of 43 altogether that were alive, and only eight of them are what I would call ready for spring, meaning that they were coming out of winter without needing substantial help from the beekeeper, whether like a lot of feeding or maybe even boosting up with a frame of root from another colony. The colonies, the requeen packages, so now I've got, um, what is that, 44 of them alive and 25 of them were uh, ready for spring without help. So way more than double. And then again, the northern raised nucleus colonies, we had 24 of them alive, 61% of them, 11 of them were ready for spring, and 72% uh, of them were needing help but still alive. And so our total alive colonies here, um, why am I having such a problem adding 91 colonies alive out of the 104? 101. 101, yeah. Sorry, yes. Um, let me just remind you quickly of the Be Informed Partnership. Does anybody here participate in this survey? Okay, everybody should be raising their hands and participating in this survey. The Be Informed Partnership is uh, part of, is used to be part of the Mid-Atlantic Apicultural Consortium, but BIP does an annual colony loss survey. And this is really the gold standard for what is happening in our bee yards. This is how we communicate over the year. But basically, what I'm saying to you is that the, the average losses that they run is in that 30 to 40% range, which is basically what my loss rate, rate was here when you look at our overall results when you get everybody all together. <coughs> Now, let's take our disqualified colonies away. So again, we had 24% of the package queens, now with the disqualified colonies out, were alive, or ready for spring. 45% were alive total. 75% of, of the northern colonies, so this is requeen packages and overwinter nucleus colonies, 75% of those colonies were alive, and 65% of them were ready for spring. So almost triple the probability of being ready for spring by just being headed by a northern queen. So, and this was over three seasons in five different apiaries. So that's pretty significant. Like that year after year, what we saw is replacing the queen in the commercial package. Literally just that one thing of take the queen out in June, and replace her with a northern raised queen, you can 
nearly triple the probability of being alive and double the probability of being quote unquote ready for spring. So, um, where you can find these project reports is here on the SARE website. You can look up the numbers or you can also just um, Google Northern. I mean, just, you can search search terms on it. Um, if you just search, if you just do search spring of honeybee, you'll find all the different projects that Sarah has funded. Some of them are relatively crackpot, but the majority of them are very good. Um, and so there's a couple of different questions that this really kind of begs. So um, it's interesting because there, uh, I believe University of Pennsylvania actually replicated this project themselves. Marianne Frazier used my data as a foundation and they did this same project and they did not experience significantly different results. Now granted, they're in Pennsylvania so they have a less winter pressure than we do and also it's funny because I kind of, when I first heard that her project hadn't worked, I was really disappointed and I was like, you know, I, I kind of wonder what's going on. And I was talking to a friend of mine, Vince Aloyo, who's a beekeeper down there and who's very familiar with the thing. And he's like, you know, the quality of collection and the quality of beekeeping done by part-time graduate students in the summer is not the same as the attention to detail that you guys paid. And I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense too. Like sometimes it's the project that's the issue. Um, the next question is, is it really that the commercial northern raised queens are better than the commercially raised queens? Or is it that boutiquely raised queens, meaning queens re reared in a much smaller operation, maybe have been in the mating nuke longer, maybe there's more genetic diversity in those operations, maybe the quality of food when the queens are being reared is better, you know, natural food versus artificial diets. So that's a question that we don't know the answer to. Is it really northern raised queens or is it boutiquely raised queens? And, um, you know, can we replicate this at a club level? I have, so I have this dream of weaseling a friend of mine who lives on Nantucket and who imports packages and he's very influential in the few Nantucket beekeepers, that they would actually go through and literally re just test, you know, write down their survival rate for say two seasons of everything that they have and then just in the third year replace all of the queens with northern raised queens, just bring in some master beekeepers to come down and help do that and then see if they can change their survival rates. And so this is something that I kind of am trying to get into the works here. Um, again, the Bee Informed Partnership will give you all kinds of information from those colony law surveys. And it is important to realize that they are very clear that causation and correlation are two different things. And so like one of the things that they will show um, is that like, for example, Apolife Life Var, the beekeepers who use Apolife Life Var see much better winter survival than beekeepers who use other mite treatments. And the question is, is Apolife Life Var that much more effective? Or is it that people who went to bee school that taught them Apolife Life Var maybe taught them other good skills and so that they are actually better beekeepers? You know what I mean? So there are a lot of questions involved in all of these things. Um, and that's kind of part of my same my same experience is that you know you've got to look at the replications these possible replications have to be of similar quality um, work so um, these were some of our collaborators and Larry Pfeiffer and Cindy and Jack who did a lot of the work um, and that's kind of the story of my stair project um, I think I have a couple of more slides here yeah okay so that is really the fundamental message that I wanted to get to you guys today, at the most basic level, is that your queen source really matters. And your own results, like if you think back of like last year, or the year before, or the year that I had the really high losses, and what did you attribute those to, whether it was your own inattention, you know, it was because I was on vacation that summer, it was the year that my friend got a boat, and, We've missed a bunch of swarms, you know. Like, we have to really kind of work on the pieces that we can control. I mean, we can't control a lot of, like, the year that I got really busy at work. You know, you, maybe you can't necessarily do that much more beekeeping. But the queen, where your queen origin comes from is something you really can control. And, um, and by that, I also would like to just 
say a couple of things about requeening packages. So I really don't believe that Southern Italian commercial queens, particularly young ones, are bad or wrong or not good to use. They are absolutely excellent for starting colonies. And I'm not the kind of person who just goes around killing queens because of I want a different queen. And so, and also I really, as you can tell by the fact that I'm chairman of EAS and also used to be president of MSDA, I really believe in beekeeping clubs. Like this is how people learn beekeeping. There's really no other way to do it other than to go work for a beekeeper. Um, you've got to communicate and get as much hands-on experience and share from other people. And so what I would love to see is us northern beekeeping clubs getting into the habit of we bring up the packages, then the good beekeepers help the bad beekeepers or the new beekeepers requeen those packages, cage those queens up, and ship them down to Metro Atlanta Bee Club. Like, get a sister city thing going on. And so we tell them, we're going to do it this weekend. We're going to do our requeening. So you guys can expect 30 to 60 queens that are going to go on Thursday, and they can get ready, and they can do their splits, and we send those good queens right back down there, where they're going to be absolutely fine in the winter, which lasts a total of five weeks. <laughs> Which it does. I mean, I'm not kidding. In Georgia, they get all crybaby about like, well, it's 28 degrees. And then in by like February, the bulbs are out. You know, it's true. And so, we, if, you know, if that's what you're acclimated to, obviously this is not going to be the best area for you. So, um, so I just want to encourage you guys to kind of think about the rest of the everything that I have to say today in the context of this. Um, I want to take... Let's do, a, we'll take a break at 10. But as I said before, like, I have a couple of things in my mind and in my tool belt that I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about queen rearing in your own yard. Well, first of all, so I'm just going to say, show of hands, who wants to learn about queen rearing in their own home yard? All right. Who wants to learn about overwinter nucleus colonies? Okay. Who wants to talk about disease and pests? <laughs> um, okay, what else did I want to talk about? Who wants to talk about swarm prevention? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh. You want to talk about swarm prevention? Okay. More about, I don't know, other aspects. Swarming? Okay, we'll do swarming after, we'll start with swarming after the break. Because that's the next thing in our season that we're all worried about. Because right now, we stand and look out our window. I, it was so funny. When Cindy was down in Georgia and we were talking on the phone before she moved up here, it was like this time of year, except it was like a gray, shitty day like the other day. And anyway, I was just looking out the window and we were talking on the phone, and she's like, what's going on? I'm like, all the bees are dead. Yeah. And she's like, what? And she thought I really meant it for real. But like, that's what you do in the winter. Is you look out of your beer, and you're like, all my bees are dead. And then as soon as spring comes, you're like, oh my god, they're all going to swarm. Like, we go from one to the other. So anyway, so let's take a break for like, until like 10 past 10. And then um, we'll come back and talk about swarming. Ed wants something. There's a question about, you know, you, you differentiated between overwinter nukes and, and, and nukes that you made by, you know, buying a queen and sticking them in with a split. Right. But what about the co new colonies that you make by, you raise queens, and then you make new colonies by splitting the ones you have and putting those queens in? That is making it over. So he's well, asking. Not he says, they're not overwintered yet. They're not overwintered yet, but that's the beginning of overwintered. Yes. So he was asking about what about splitting your own colony with your own raised queens, and we're going to talk about that for the whole rest of the day. So yeah. Um, so yeah, let's do like ten past ten, and I'm going to figure out my slides here. <laughs>